Today we want to turn our Bibles to the book of 2 Thessalonians and the third chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, and verses 1 and 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, and verses 1 and 2. And I want to speak to you about this passage as Paul here is writing to the believers in Thessalonica, the church that is there. He says in verse number 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is in you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. <clears throat> Let's go to God in prayer and ask his blessing on our time together today. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather here today with the good folks here at Bethel. Lord, thank you for their faithful prayers and gifts that allow us to serve you in Ukraine and in Laos and other parts of the world. Bless now this time as we open your word. Father, may you speak to our hearts and we commit this service now to you. We ask your blessing upon it for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. And it's in Christ's name we ask and pray. Amen. All right, Paul here begins this by saying, brethren, finally, brethren, pray for us. And we often find the Apostle Paul seeking the prayers of God's people. We see him doing it in Ephesians. Uh, if you're, are you in Ephesians chapter 6 now? Is that where you are? No, but we read it this morning. Okay, all right. But you see in Ephesians, the invitation that Paul gave to them to pray for him and specifically how to pray. In Colossians, Paul encourages them to pray for him and how to pray. Uh, in the book of Romans, Paul writes to them, strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So Paul is often recruiting prayer warriors, right? Why is Paul so actively recruiting others to pray for him and for his ministry as a missionary? Why was Paul asking others to pray like that? Because Paul knows what? That God answers prayer. But Paul, Paul also knows that without the power and hand of God, Paul can't accomplish what God wants him to do. So he needs God. And what is going to bring God into the equation? What's going to bring God's hand, God's blessing? It's going to be the prayers of God's people, right? So Paul is seeking for those to pray for him that the mission God has called him to do can be accomplished. So I want you to listen. I'm going to read a quote here uh, from A.C. Dixon. Uh, but this is the quote. When we rely upon organization, we get what organization can do. When we rely upon education, we get what education can do. When we rely upon eloquence, we get what eloquence can do, and so on. But when we rely upon prayer, we get what God can do. And we need today, more than ever, what God can do, right? We need it in our churches. Uh, we need it in our country. Uh, we need it in our missionaries who we send into these various parts of the world with the gospel. We need what God can do. And what is going to cause, again, God to do what God can do, what's going to promote that work of God? The prayers of God's people. And you see, what Paul understood, and, and what we need to catch this morning, is this understanding that missions is a partnership, right? It's not a, a tennis, you know, I know they have doubles in tennis, but a lot of tennis is singles, right? And it's every man for himself doing the best that he can do. But missions is not an individual sport. It's not like golf or like tennis. Uh, missions is a team sport, if you will. It's a team competition. It's the local church, God's people, working together to spread the gospel into the world. Everyone fulfilling the role on the team that God has called them to. I play basketball. I bet you don't understand why I play basketball. <laughs> but I played basketball when I was, when I was younger. And, uh, and when I played basketball, you know, you have a coach. And that you've got five players at a time that are out on the floor, and the coach directs those players. Not everybody gets to shoot when they want to shoot. How many play basketball? Anybody, any <laughs> basketball players in here? I know New York, your, your professional teams haven't been so good lately. <laughs> so a little bit yet. The Brooklyn Nets have probably been a little bit better than the Knickerbockers, right? But we have to go back in the 70s for the Knicks when they were at Clyde Live when they were any good back in the day. But, uh, what, what do we have in basketball? Not everyone gets to shoot the ball. I mean, the coach has, this guy's a shooter, this guy's a shooter. You set picks, right? You help to get these guys open. You play defense, you rebound. 
you're working together as a team to be the best that you can be. Well, missions is like that. We're working together on a team. Now, some on the team are called by God to go. And when we're called by God to go, we're called to go to the various parts of the world where God sends us to go. Now, we're all called to go locally, but some are called to go to other cultures and other countries and other places with the gospel. But for those who are called to stay at home, they're not, they're working international missions, world missions is not complete. Their mission is really just as important, if not more so, by what they have to do from the home front that really enables those that have been sent to do what God has called them to do. And one of the great ways that we fulfill that is through our prayers, by praying for our missionaries, by striving together with them. That word striving is agonizing in prayer. So we're not just now I lay me down to sleep, I pray my soul, the Lord shall keep type of prayer, but truly agonizing in prayer for God's glory, for God's power to be known through these missionaries that have been sent by these local churches. So I want to explain today, or, or at least try to explain more from the Word of God today, your role in this. I think we understand you're going to have grace giving, which is a wonderful way to participate in world missions by giving gifts that we give that enable the missionary financially uh, to go. And these are gifts that you give, not for the benefit of the missionary, as Paul writes in Philippians, uh, but that fruit may abound to your account. So as we give, as souls are reached through these various ministries and missionaries that go, there's fruit that abounds to your account, right? So giving is one way that we have a, have a part in missions, but prayer. When we make a commitment to send financially these missionaries, we're also making a commitment to pray for these missionaries. And I would say the greater commitment and the more difficult commitment between giving finances and giving prayers, giving prayer is way more difficult. And it's much more work. It's really spiritual work and labor to do. Uh, very, very difficult. And uh, I think one of the things I'd like to share, I think the greatest need in missions today is prayer. And missions truly begins with prayer. I'm, I'm excited to hear about your prayer meetings you're having uh, here, just asking for God to do something. And that's really where we begin. We begin with God. Because if we're going to do the mission that God has called us to do, it's going to require God because it's beyond anybody in this room. None of us, the church today, we cannot fulfill the mission we've been called to do. God's going to have to do it. Now, he says, brethren, pray for us. Now, notice what he says. Number one, he's going to have three requests of prayer this morning. Number one, that the word of the Lord may have what? May have free course. What does that mean? That the word of the Lord may have free course. That means that there might be open doors of utterance, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be unhindered. Okay? So Paul is saying, pray for me. That as I go forth, that God's word would be free, that, that there would be unlimited opportunities to preach the gospel. That Satan, who wants to hinder the gospel and keep the gospel, not allow the gospel to spread, that those little hindrances that he puts up, those, those walls that he puts up, that those would be taken away and there would be open doors from God to preach the gospel. Now listen, we look in our world today. And uh, what is there, over 8 billion people in the world, 8.1, 8.2, and driving here in New York City, I think the majority of them are right here. All right, you got a lot of people here in New York. Uh, but in the world, I've been to Bangkok, <clears throat> large, large city. I think Bangkok is 8 million or something people, uh, also a very large city. We've been in various places, large areas, but 8 billion in the world. Do you know how many roughly have heard the gospel? Uh, I, I've read that uh, estimated that somewhere around 30% of the world has heard a true gospel presentation. 30%. So that, that means that, uh, what would that be? Somewhere around uh, 2.4 billion have heard a clear gospel presentation, but the balance, just shy of 6 billion, have never heard a clear gospel presentation. And that's pretty amazing. When you think about it, because when Christ gave the Great Commission uh, to his disciples, where, where were they supposed to preach the gospel to? All nations, right? Every creature in every nation. 
So not only all nations, which if you look in that word, all nations, it's ethnic groups of people. There's a lot more ethnic groups of people than there are nations. We are also have a ministry in Laos, and we'll share a little bit about with you with that on the uh, the picture time that we'll have, the uh, presentation time. But in Laos, about 126 people groups. I mean, you've got Hmong. Well, the Hmong people, you've got green Hmong, you've got white Hmong, you've got black Hmong. You've got Kamu people, you've got Brew people, you've got various types of Brew people, plus you got the Laotian people. I mean, it just goes on and on. You've got 126 people groups. So though Laos is one nation, it's one nation made up of 126 people groups. You would have a few people groups here in New York City, right? You've got a few people groups here in New York City. So I'm just saying, Christ is saying that the gospel is to be preached in every people group and to every creature within every people group. But today, only 30% have heard a clear gospel presentation. Now, that means 70% have not heard. 70% of the world's population has not heard a clear gospel presentation. Now, we take that 70%, we're going to break it into two parts, all right? The first part is going to be 40% and 30%, all right? So let's talk about the 30%. Who are these 30% that have not heard a clear gospel presentation? Well, they are those that live in an area like this. They have the potential to hear the gospel, just they've never heard the gospel. There's a church there. There are believers there. The gospel is there, just they've never heard a direct gospel presentation. I uh, pastored for a while back in the Kansas City area, and that's where we are from. And uh, it was amazing during our seven years of ministry there, the numbers of people you would meet. And I think they had never heard the gospel before. They even, some went to evangelical type churches, but they'd never heard the true gospel. I mean, they would tell me things like, and then again, this would be considered an evangelical church they were attending. And I'd ask them, well, when you die, where's your soul going? And their reply would be, well, I'm trying to do the best I can, and I'm trying to, to make my way there to heaven. I said, well, listen, That's uh, you, you, you can try all you want to, but you're never going to be able to work your way there because you, you've sinned and offended a holy God. How is that guilt for your sin? How is that penalty of your sin going to be removed? I don't care how hard you work to remove the stain of sin. There's nothing you can do that can remove that stain. You don't want justification from God when you come before him as your judge. You're going to want grace from God, right? And that grace from God is only going to come through Jesus Christ. I have a friend lived over in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, not too far from the Kansas City area. And uh, his name is Tony. He attended, uh, grew up Catholic, went to Catholic church. He told me, he said, Brother Derek, I didn't hear the gospel for the first time until I was 36 years old. And he went through some difficult things, destroyed marriage, home, I mean, his life. And God has completely rebuilt him in just a wonderful, miraculous way. But how could it be that someone like that grew up in Topeka, Kansas? There were churches in Topeka, churches that knew the gospel in Topeka. I mean, he went to public high school in Topeka, Kansas. He played on ball teams in Topeka. You mean not, nobody in his high school knew the Lord? There no teachers, no fellow students, no coaches, nobody in his neighborhood knew the Lord? Well, evidently, nobody shared the gospel with him until he was 36 years old. You know, you have people like that surrounding you here, right? 30% that have not heard yet the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have the potential to hear. Just no one has shared that message with them. Maybe it's somebody that you work with. Maybe it's that neighbor that lives across the hallway or across the street. Maybe it's uh, somebody that you're in school with, right? But God has you there for a purpose to share that hope and truth of the gospel of Christ. All right, so 70% have not heard a clear gospel presentation. 30% have potential, just have never heard. But 40% live in an area of our world, and they have no potential to hear the gospel. 40%. We took some of our young men to the country of Tajikistan, and we held a camp in Tajikistan, and it was one of the most miraculous ministry trips I've ever been on before, one of the physically hardest trips I've ever been on, but 
one of the most blessed trips I've ever been on. But in Tajikistan, they are considered 99% unreached with the gospel. So it's Islamic country. 99% of those people have no potential to hear the gospel. There's no church. They're never going to meet a Christian, a born-again Christian. They have no opportunity. They're going to go from cradle to grave and never once hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, for you and me, I mean, that should astound us today. How can there be places like this in the world after 2,000 years of the church having the gospel there are still so many areas of our world unreached with that gospel. Of those people groups in Laos, the 126 different people groups, I think 83 point something percent of them unreached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you might be saying, well, look, Brother Derek, I mean, this is beyond us. There are doors. I mean, Laos is a communist country. Tajikistan is Islamic. I mean, if we just go in there, it's dangerous. The doors are cut. We're going to have all kinds of adversaries. Well, I understand that. But, but, but this is why we come to God first in prayer. Because we can't do it. But he can do it. Right? We can't open these doors. We can't provide the needed laborers that are needed for this mission to be completed. But he can provide in every way. And he desires to provide. But guess what? We have not what? Because we ask not. I want you to think for a moment about uh, Coca-Cola. All right? Any Coca-Cola fans here today? I'm not trying to start a church split between Coke and Pepsi. And all, that, so not all right, I'm going to leave the church in division here today, Pastor. Uh, but no, Coca-Cola been around for how long? About 140, 145 years, something like that. All right, give or take. Guy down there in Atlanta area in his garage, right? Took some sugared water and different stuff, came up with Coca Cola. And now, 145 years later, it's estimated that the Coca Cola logo is recognized in like 98% of the world. I mean, I've been to places in Laos and Tajikistan and Ukraine and all these various places. Almost anywhere I go, you, I don't care how small the little village is, how small the little kiosk is that's selling, you can get Coca-Cola. And most of the time, you can get Coke Zero if you really want to get Zero. <laughs> well, how did Coca-Cola make it to 98% of the world in 145 years? But the church has had the gospel for 2,000 years and has only reached about 30% of the world's population. How can that be? And you know what's even sadder about that is that the church is content with it being that way. We're really not stirred to make a difference. And really where we begin to make that difference is where? On our knees before God. Crying out to God. And the first question we should be asking God is, God, what do you want from me? I mean, this call to take the gospel into all the world, Lord, this is beyond me. But what part do you want me to do? Do you want me to go? Is there somebody, you know, listen, Moses didn't start his ministry really until he was 80 years old, right? I'm looking out there today. I don't think I see too many over the age of 80. Okay. Uh, so God, you'll be surprised. God can use, use you in just many different amazing ways. It's not based upon your physical abilities or even your age. Just God can do it. But the first thing we should do coming before God is God. What, what is it you want? What part do you want me to play? And if God is calling you to stay, then God is calling you to pray. To begin praying for your missionaries, what request? Lord, open doors of utterance. God, let your word have free course. Right now in Ukraine, we have seen during this time of war, we have seen open door after open door. And I am telling you, it is amazing uh, to see what we have seen. The men in Ukraine, the servants of Ukraine, they can't believe the opportunities that they're experiencing right now. Because God is just opening these doors. One of our men had a refugee center, a secular refugee center of about 450 <clears throat> refugees. And he came to our pastor and he said, look, these refugees have no hope. And, and they are. Julie can share, maybe I'll have her share a story when we 
have our sharing time here a little bit later on, but about the suicide and what's happening in Ukraine. So many are discouraged. They've lost their homes. They've lost everything. They live in this fear all the time. I mean, why should we uh, continue living, right? Why should I uh, continue on? So this director said, look, this uh, these refugees have no hope. And he said, he came to the pastor and he said, I don't care what you teach from the Bible, but do you have a message of hope? These people need hope. Do you have a message of hope? And of course, our pastor said, what? Yes, we have a message of hope, right? And there was an open door for him just to go and preach to 450 lost refugees searching for hope. Your prayers for open doors can make a difference, right? Yes, there are closed doors. Yes, there are restricted access countries in the world. But you know what I'm finding at this this last time, and I don't know where we are in God's prophetic calendar and all that, but I'll tell you this, if we're not in the early stages of the of those last days the Bible warns us about, we're, we're right on the doorstep of them, right? Or we're somewhere in there. And it could be just any time the Lord is coming. And I just find that the Lord is opening doors. But we should be praying for doors to be open. We should be praying for laborers to take that message into these countries. I mean, listen, you, you, you pray for Laos right now, 126 people groups. I think in our Bible Institute, we have nine different people groups represented. That means there, there's still, what, 118 people groups that we have had no training to help train them to reach their own people. That's a lot of people groups, right? Well, what do we need? We need laborers to train. We need workers to train. We need God to call these laborers for them to be sent into this harvest that is great, that is white, that is red. So Paul begins with this thought. He says, listen, pray that the word of the Lord will have free course. Pray for there to be open doors. Pray for Satan and all the hindrances he wants to put out, for him to be pushed aside, for him to be negated, and for there to be these opportunities to preach. So right, that's number one. What's the second request that Paul gives here in the last part of verse number three or one? He says that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. So not just for the opportunity to preach the gospel, right? but for the power to preach the gospel. Not just for the gospel to be heard, but for the gospel to be responded to. For them to understand that, yes, I am this lost sinner apart from God, guilty before a holy God, right? That I need God's grace, that, that I am condemned to death and hell, and I need him, and Jesus is the answer, and to respond to that message of Christ. Well, what Paul is saying is, your prayers can help promote souls coming to Christ. Is that what he's saying? Is that what's being written here? Yeah. You have not what? Because you ask not. Paul is saying here, pray for me that the gospel will be glorified. If you look at great times of revival and awakenings in the history of the world, you'll find they were always preceded by what? By prayer. When we see the church finally coming together and crying out to God, then you're going to see a great movement of God. In Ukraine, when the war started, guess where churches were doing? They were having nightly prayer meetings. I mean, every night churches were gathered together. They were praying together. They were crying out to God together. And I mean, it was every night. Now, the, some of the places where they were, they had blackouts, so they had to be home before the blackout times came. But they were crying out to God. God, we don't know what to do. God, we're just committing this to you. God, we give ourselves to you. God, we ask you would bless and use this time somehow for your glory and for your praise. Well, now you see churches in Ukraine that before the war were running maybe 120, that are now running 300, 350. How did that happen? How come there's so many baptisms right now and so many things happening in Ukraine? Could it be that God answers prayer? Could it be that there were Ukrainians crying out for God to glorify his gospel in these lost, sinful, heathen hearts, right? And my friend, God is answering that prayer. 
I remember reading of uh, James Stewart. Pastor and I were talking about James Stewart a little bit yesterday. He had been a missionary over in Eastern Europe. And specifically, he was in Latvia, in a church in Latvia. And uh, he writes about this morning service that he had in this church. And he says that morning when he preached, he said there was a power of God. He said it was just like the very presence of God was there. There were decisions that, that morning for God. He said it was just very special. So he said that night they asked him to come back and preach again. And he said, so yeah, I, I agreed. And I decided I, I would get there a little bit early before the service because I wanted to have some time alone with God just to pray and ask God for his blessing. So he said, I got there early before the service and I went down into the basement of the church underneath. And if you've ever been to Eastern Europe, I don't know how many of you have been there or not, but I, you know, in my mind, I can see this picture of what this church would have looked like. You come down into this basement. It was dark and kind of dungy down in there. And he sees off in the corner uh, a light where the furnace was. And he said, well, I'll, I'll head over towards that light where that furnace is. It, it'll be a little warmer over there and it's a little light over there. And I'll pray when I get over there and I'll, I'm going to cry out. I'm going to ask God to bless us tonight like he did this morning. And he says he gets over near that light, and as he gets close to the light, he sees three women. They're on their faces on that basement floor, completely sprawled out on their faces, and they were crying out to God. And he said, then I understood why I had such freedom and why I had such power this morning. Somebody was praying, right? Somebody was crying out to God. You see, we need God. We need what God can do. And prayer gives us what God can do. Do you ever think about this? When you pray, all three persons of the Godhead go into action. Now, for me, this is just beyond belief, right? I mean, here I am, just mortal man. And when I pray, immortal, infinite God, all three persons of the triune God go into action. Yes, that's what the Bible teaches. When we come to God in prayer, what's the Father doing? He's receiving our prayer. He says, come boldly to my throne of grace, where you can receive this grace and help in time of need, right? So we're coming to the Father. We're coming to his presence, and he welcomes us to come. Think back about the Old Testament. I mean, you just couldn't come to the very presence of presences of God. In fact, in the Old Testament, you didn't find anyone praying to God as Father, did you? Who's the first person that begins to pray to God as Father? Jesus Christ, who made a way for us by his shed blood on the cross that we could pray to him as Father, Abba, Father, right? Jesus Christ. But in the Old Testament... They had a place of the tabernacle or the temple. They had this place within that tabernacle or temple called the Holy of Holies. That is where the Ark of the Covenant was. That was where you could consider the very presence of presences of God on earth was in that Holy of Holies. And the high priest could only go into that place how many times a year? So one man could go in there one time a year into that very presence of presences of God under the law. Not everyone, no one else could go in there, right? No one else could call him Father. No one else had these guarantees of God hearing the prayer. But in New Testament time, the testament of grace that you and I are under today, if we know Jesus Christ, if we have received him in his blood and his spirit indwells us, we are welcome to come boldly to that very presence of presences of God, not on earth, but in eternal glory in heaven. And there God welcomes us to come. And when we pray, God the Father receives our prayers. Now, what's God the Son doing when we pray? Well, he's sitting there at the right hand of the Father. He gives authority to our prayer. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Christ said, whatever you ask in my name, it shall be given unto you, right? So when we're coming to the Father and we're praying to the Father, we are praying to the Father coming boldly by the blood of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ are we asking. And Christ, our Savior, our Lord, is giving power to our prayer, authority to that prayer. Father, receive that prayer as you would receive it from my lips because it's being prayed in my name. 
Isn't that wonderful? Yes. So God the Son is working when we pray. He's, he's, he's empowering the prayer. He's authoritating the prayer. I mean, he's giving it authority. So God the Father's receiving it. God the Son is giving authority to it. What's God the Holy Spirit doing when we pray? He's perfecting it. He's taking the prayer and he's presenting it before the throne of grace with words that we can't even humanly utter. Right? I mean, some people are worried, well, I didn't pray the right thing. Well, just pray to God. The Spirit of God is taking your prayer and perfecting the prayer. He's presenting it there in a perfect way before that very throne of grace. Isn't that amazing that all three persons of the Godhead are at work when we pray? <laughs> That's why Satan fights us so much not to pray. I mean, listen, I pastored and you know, in different places and, and back in Kansas City and over in Lithuania and in, in Ukraine. I'm just telling you right now, some of the differences are the one meeting that, that Satan does not want people to come to is the prayer meeting. They can come to a Bible study. I mean, he's not real excited about a Bible study. He doesn't really want you to learn the Bible. He doesn't want you to be set free by the Word of God. But I'm going to tell you what he really doesn't want. He really doesn't want the church to pray. He really doesn't want the church to gather corporately in prayer. We were in a church down near the uh, uh, Romania Moldovan border in the Chernum Sea area. And uh, we were in a church down there, and it was uh, that evening at about uh, uh, somewhere 6 p.m. or so, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., sirens are going on. There was a meeting that night, okay? A, 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 a meeting within the church, and and here you are. You hear the sirens going off, and you're thinking, "Well, what do we what do we do? Or do we go to a bomb shelter ride?" What, what? And of course, they still had church. It didn't hinder them from that. They still had church. So we're, we're in the church, and uh, and I'm seated up there on the on the platform, and and they've got a large choir, and I hear this choir singing, and I thought, you know, I haven't heard corporate singing like this, and I don't know when. I mean, these people are really singing with passion. Then later there was a time of corporate prayer. And I thought to myself, I haven't heard corporate prayer like this since I don't know when. I mean, you'd hear them praying down here uh, on the uh, on, in the floor down below. You heard them up in the choir loft praying up there. You hear them answering each other. Yes, Lord. Amen, Lord. Let it be so, Lord. I mean, it's just this prayer meeting is going on. And the whole time I'm sitting up there and I'm thinking, look, you people are crazy. Don't you realize that at any moment of time, there's going to be a big explosion, right? A missile. And we're all going to be in the presence of Jesus together. <laughs> Don't you guys understand this? And then it dawns on you. Well, that's why they're singing this way. And that's why they're praying this way. Because they're living this life with this constant expectancy that at any moment of time, they're going to be face to face with the Lord. You know, you could say the war in Ukraine has brought an awakening of souls to Christ, but you could also say the war in Ukraine has brought a revival within the churches of Ukraine. To those that have stayed, there's been a revival that has taken place. And it all begins with what? With prayer. So Paul is saying, you pray for me, number one, that the word of the Lord will have free course. Pray for me, number two, that the gospel, when I have these opportunities to preach it, that it will be glorify. Right. Pray for me, number three, for what? We'll look down in verse number two. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. So Paul's third request is for his protection, that God would keep him, that God would, would guard him, if you will. And Paul makes this also in Romans. You could say he makes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the same request when he says to you, and he tells the believers there in Corinth, you laboring to, together with us in prayer. Well, if you look in context, it's really, it's the prayer he's speaking about is them praying for him to be protected. Why does Paul need God's protection? Because Paul is taking a message that's calling the culture to which Paul goes to, to repentance. And what is repentance? That's acknowledging what? That we are wrong, that our traditions are wrong, 
that my mother was wrong. Now this is now you're getting on holy ground, sacred ground. That my grandmother was wrong and my great grandmother was wrong, right? That that these this religion or these traditions are not a way to have peace with a God or with God's a plurality of God, but that there's one way to God and there's one way of forgiveness with God, and that's through the blood and the person of Jesus Christ. And that's it. Well, you take that message and you follow Paul through Acts. How popular was Paul? I mean, was he stoned? Was he beaten? Was he thrown in prison? Yes. Yeah, that, that culture, I mean, there were souls that responded, and were, and that's why we go is for the souls that respond. But I'm just telling you, being a missionary could be kind of dangerous. Uh, you're, you're over there in, uh, in Laos. They have Buddhism. And a, a fairly large percentage are Buddhist. If they're Laotian, they're going to be Buddhist. But if they're within like the Hmong tribes or the Kamu tribes, some of these other tribes of people, they're going to be animus. What is animism? Animism is the worship of spirits. And everything has a spirit, both animate and inanimate, it has a spirit. And you have to worship these spirits and answer these spirits if you want the blessings from these spirits. Wow, you talk about opening up to demonic activity, right? And really Buddhism and animism, because really it's kind of a mixture of the two there in, in Laos. It's just going to be very demonic. But I'm telling you, those people, you're not going to be popular when you come in and you say, "There's look, there's a true and living way, Jesus Christ. And you're going to share that message and immediately it's going to be rejected and your life is going to be threatened. And Paul is saying, we need to be praying for our missionaries, <clears throat> for God to protect and keep them. Well, there was a missionary recently in Baghdad, the independent Baptist missionary. He was shot, seated right next to his wife. I wonder if the churches that supported him, if they had been praying for him, for God to keep him. We have a responsibility. That doesn't mean it wasn't the will of God. Nothing catches God by surprise. But we have our role to play, right? To pray for them and for God to keep and protect them. I would ask you to pray for our very many faithful men and women in Ukraine that are serving, taking the gospel into some very dangerous areas. We had one man who uh, went into the city of uh, uh, Bakhmut, and uh, I don't know if you follow the war or not, but Bakhmut is one of the most hotly contested areas and has been for probably four or five months, six months now. But he was there earlier in the year when, when it was still very, very dangerous. There was still somewhere between estimated five and 7,000 people in Bakhmut. There were people that were living down below in a bomb shelter. And uh, Nikolai, our guy, came in there, brought aid. But more than the aid, he brought the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he went down below and ministered to them, sang with them, uh, gave them aid, prayed with them. And I remember thinking, because he did a little video up above, and you could hear the rockets, the missiles going over his head. And they weren't hitting, you know, five, seven miles away. They were hitting five or seven blocks away. And I remember thinking, I, I need to talk to Nikolai and tell him, look, man, you got a wife, you got children, you got a church that you're pastoring. Do you really think you should be risking your life to go there? And then it dawned on me, well, what about if I was one of those five or seven thousand? Would I want someone like Nikolai to risk their life to bring me the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ? I mean, if I'm down in that basement and I'm hearing the explosions and I'm I'm hearing the, the bullets that are that are flying, would, would I want someone to come and bring me the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And the answer is why? Of course I would. And I just shared with him, I said, Nikolai, look, I'm not going to tell you what to do. God has to tell you that, but if you're not sure that God is calling you to go there, don't go there if you're not sure. But if God is clearly calling you, then go and take that message, right? But we have men that are risking their lives in that way to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to people in such conditions in Ukraine. We would covet your prayers for that. Now, listen, I want to give you a quote and then close with this illustration, okay? Here, here is the quote. Almost everyone believes that prayer is important. But there is a difference between believing that prayer is important and believing it is essential. Essential means there are things that will not happen without prayer. 
All of us believe prayer is what? Important. But how many of us believe that prayer is essential? And what does essential mean? There are things that will not happen if we do not pray. There are churches that are not going to be started if we do not pray. There are souls that are not going to be saved if we are not praying. There are laborers that are not going to be called unless we're praying. You see, your prayers are not just important. Your prayers are what? Essential. And those missionaries back there on your back board, they need your essential prayers. And without your essential prayers, the mission God has called them to cannot be accomplished. Because you're on the team. And you're the prayer team, right? If you're not called to go, you're called to stay. If you're called to stay, you're called to pray. 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 All right. Now, here's the illustration I want you to think about from the book of Exodus, 17th chapter. You remember the story there? Moses goes up on the hill and uh, with Aaron and her, Joshua goes down into the valley with the army of Israel to fight against the Amalekites, right? And uh, as Joshua goes down below to do the battle and the fighting, Moses is up on the hill. His hands are lifted up to God, symbolizing what? Prayer to God, dependence on God, right? As his hands are up, Joshua's experiencing victory down below. Didn't matter that the Amalekites had greater weapons, a larger army, greater training. None of that mattered. Israel had the God of Israel, right? And they were winning that battle. But you remember the story. Moses gets tired. His arms come down. Yeah, and instantly when his hands come down, what happened? They start to lose that battle down below. All of a sudden, it was going from the victory they were winning to now they're losing. And then you remember Aaron and Hur come alongside Moses. They lift up his hands back up into the air until the victory is won down below. So here's my question for you. Where was the victory won? Won in prayer. You have missionaries. They're going down into the valley to do the hand-to-hand combat, right? God has called them to go, and they're willingly to, and they were, they're willing to go, and praise God for them. But if the victory is going to be won down there in the valley, where is it going to be won? It's going to be won in prayer up on the hill. And if you're not called to go, you're called to stay. And if you're called to stay, you're called to pray. pray. You're called to go up on the hill and lift up your hands in prayer and say, God, open these doors of heavens. Give your word free course in Laos, in Tajikistan, in Ukraine, in these various countries. Oh, Lord, not just the open doors and opportunities for them to preach the gospel, but, Lord, let your gospel be glorified in hearts. Let it be preached in such a way by the blessing of your spirit that these souls that are listening are convicted of their sin. They're convicted of their lack of righteousness. They're convicted of this judgment that is coming, and this judgment to them is certain. They know hell is coming. And then, Lord, allow them to see the glory of Christ, the answer of Christ from his cross. God, glorify your gospel. And, Lord, while these servants are going and taking this message out, God, guard them and protect them. Supernaturally, Lord. Listen, I love what John Wesley would say. I am immortal until God is done. We should be praying, God, keep them and watch them. Listen, my friends, your missionaries require your essential prayers. And I want to encourage you. If God has not called you to go, he's called you to stay. He's called you to stay. He's called you to pray. Come up on the mountain, right? Let's lift up our hands for our missionaries in prayer. And let's labor there on that mountain in prayer until the victory is won. Until Christ returns, okay? Brethren, pray for us.